Today I am joined by Owen Paul McGee. Most of known as Owen Paul. Owen Paul, let me get this right. You was a stop, long... Stop right there. Owen Paul McGee, yeah? <sighs> you want to say it as no, Owen you Paul? you started that. I know, but, you know, <laughs> see viewers, I know this was going to happen, because most of you guys out there would know as my Owen Paul. Mm. Which is my... OPM. Yes, that'll do. My real name is Owen McGee. The, the Paul... Who's your brother's name? Egg. I do my research. Oh, hello. And I've got your brother's number. That's true. Well, oh. I stole it off my brother. I kept me... Well, that's not completely true. I named him as well. Really? Yes. We had a late addition to our family. My mum and dad were quite old when they had the... And it was like 14, 15 the... years. Did the thing, you know. <laughs> uh, it was 14, 15 years between their last child and my brother, Paul. But because we were all... I was, I think, 15, 16 when he was on the way. Received. They said you guys can contribute, maybe come up with his name. And we all put it in a hat, and my choice was Paul, and that's the one they picked out. So then when I became a musician guy, I thought, Owen McGee? That sounds like a country and western kind of yeah. thing. You know, Owen McGee and the Strangers, or something. So I thought, I'll take the Paul bit back and use that. There you go, viewers. We learned something new today. Owen oh, Paul McGee, let me get this right. A lad from a small place in Scotland called Glasgow, you... Played football, you was a Celtic, am I right? You went for Celtic trials. Easy, easy. There's more than that. Okay, hold on, let me get there, let me get there, I'm right. getting there. I played for them, I, I won the uh, trials. I, really? Yeah. Okay. Professional player for I Celtic. Signed. Sign. Played for my country as well. Schoolboys? Scottish schoolboys, yeah. Well, I'm learning more. I should do more on Wikipedia next time. Yeah. So you're this guy who plays football, loves music, suddenly you've become this 80s long haired pop star. Well, where, did, where did this happen? Where did, I know where did it all well. go wrong? No, no. <laughs> we, I don't really want to talk about the early days because yeah. I know damn well that you really wanted to be and you, you were and you still are a rocker at heart. You know, you've, yeah. you've got a powerful voice and you did rock music. I mean, how did it end up that you ended up... How did that I end? don't even want to say the song title today. Not yet, anyway. No. But no, how did I, well, it was a complete and utter fluke and a mistake and um, some would say, it, well, actually, I would say it ruined my career in a f moment. You're right, I was a rock act. I was already playing around the circuit all over the UK from 15 years of age, like punk bars and new wave and that kind of thing. And um, then I stupidly, on a whim, because I'm a whimsical guy, as I'm sure you know, yeah, yes. uh, I had a studio session booked to record my next track uh, with the record company I was with, and they were expecting me to go in and record one of my rock, slightly more rocky pop things, still pop, but rock pop, right? And I'd heard this clip of Bette Midler singing just the chorus of My Favourite Waste of Time. I've now said the name of the song. I wasn't going to say it. Bette Midler doing it, I was like, oh my God, what's that? Played the, it was VHS, that was all we had back in the days. It was Beat you were Max lucky I had Betamax. Betamax, what a loser. <laughs> Betamax, VHS, although everyone said Betamax yeah. should win, but it didn't. Yeah. They probably they should have done it, but anyway. So played the VHS over and over again, but all she sung during our show was just the chorus. So I spoke to my management company and they, in the morning, this is like, I mean, I was up all night listening to this. I became obsessed with it overnight. You know what it's like? Yeah. Know? Birds were tweeting and I'm still sitting there going, nah, favorite was No one had known anything about the song or where it came from. And it turns out she'd never released it either. It was a B-side or something of hers. And then we find out that it was a guy called Marshall Crenshaw, country and western act. And then they played me the, the version. I was like, Ooh. No disrespect to him. Yeah. I mean, he made plenty out of me, of but course, yes. believe me, so I got no qualms about being disrespectful to him, but that's besides the point. So in the morning, I went straight to the studio. Somebody got me a cassette of his version, didn't like it, changed some words, but wrote new bits in it, which I'm not credited for, see in court. Uh, it's all true, you know. I believe uh, and after eight years, you're not allowed to go back to court, so uh, my record company made me sign away my rights, otherwise he wouldn't let me release it. Anyway, I wrote stuff, did the thing, went to the studio on the day, said to all the guys in the band, forget what you think we're going to record, this is what we're going to do. They're like, you're off your head. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, probably, but we're, we're doing it. As soon as we finished it recording, and I'm not joking, we must have recorded that in two and a half hours, three hours max. In the 80s, that was unheard of. You could do two weeks recording one track. The guys in Tears for Fears, you know what I'm saying? Well, they're renowned. Well, they're like three and a half months for like... Just the chorus. Everybody wants to, anyway. Exactly, and the rest, that took, I mean, they, they recorded that three times. That whole album. As for U2's uh, Where well, the Streets Have No Name, that took three months to record. The rest of the album took two weeks. Just that one track took three months. Anyway, we, we digress. Okay. Uh, but anyway, recorded it, favourite waste of time, two and a half hours, boom, 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 we're like, oh, 
this is going to be good. This is going you to be knew so then? Totally. I, I, we got goosebumps and scared, and everyone else was like, well, hey, we're part of an act that's going to have a smash hit. And I was thinking, mm. that's a problem. And I thought, I know what record companies are like. They're going to make me a pin-up guy. I'm going to be on the smash hits, and you know those mags are number one. And I turned out to be completely right. And then every other thing I had, every other song I had, they weren't interested, interested in one unless it was like that. And I'm the complete opposite, and I'm a like, fight for your rights socialist guy. I'm like, well, you're not getting anything then. So we got into loggerheads, and it all became very, very messy and very ugly. So I then wasn't allowed to make any recordings for some time. Which is yeah. why I disappeared off Th the face that, of the that earth. That was like, you know, I mean, you know, I, I did read something about that. And then mm. suddenly you, you, you're off the face of the earth, and you sort of... Something happened, something in your head where you've, you've done loads of your other businesses, you, you know, you've been a, a, a neighbour from hell, and you've, you've done things like that, you know. And then suddenly, I believe in 2000, something happened again musically to you that sort of brought that passion. I don't, I'm not saying the passion went, no. but you suddenly it just came back. Well, that, yeah, you know, you're right. And you're, what um, was that? You, and I think, no, you're right in two points. It's not a particular thing. I think you're right on the second point you made, which is that it never went away. So I've always been that guy. I'm always the guy that's obsessed. I was always writing and recording and doing stuff in my own. I wasn't ever caring whether anyone heard it or not. And the only difference is that people from the outside, once I hadn't done records for years, said, people should be hearing that. Yeah, and that's that, what changed. That's the difference. Right, whereas I was quite happy to be writing the songs, doing the stuff. I wasn't really bothered. There's some part of me that, you know, regardless of whether I was working on a building site, and I've done plenty of jobs, believe me, where I would still be going in my head, oh, there's an idea for a song, there's a thing. I was always, always doing so the it. words, melodies were always there. All of, all of it was always going on. And then, like you said, other people saying, you know, they tell a couple of things that I'd recorded on like a mini disc or whatever. They were like, you, guy, you should be doing that, man, that's who you are. So then I thought, okay, here we go, back in the scene, let's do the thing. But this time... It's because, on your terms. Well, be yes, mainly because you know, for the want of a better term, because I could afford it. Yeah. Because I could afford to make the records at my own pace, do, do the way I wanted, and I didn't have to, most record companies would go, well, that song's too long, you have to cut that, we get, have to get to the chorus before 60 seconds. I was like, this is how the song goes, take it or leave it. And I recorded in the studio like that, so we then put on a full-scale recording, worked with brilliant people like Paul Carrick and Rod Argent, and went to Abbey Road and did the orchestra, and like 42, I'm in the middle going, Wah. Because the budget was good, because it was my own, but I had control over what yeah. they were doing. It wasn't like, well, we better make the 12 inch dance track to suit the, the time. Ethiopian yeah, market yeah. or whatever it is that they want, you know. I'd like to hear that mix, the Ethiopian dance mix. It's, really good, it. it's like... really good, but you've got to be fast and you won't catch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, you, you know, this passion come up, and you're building your own stuff and you're doing your own stuff, and going back on the road must have been a bit for you, because like tonight we're here to see, see you perform, and, and yeah. you know, when you went back on the stage for the first time, what, did, what was that feeling like for you? Similar to the other stuff, again, it's one of those things that's part of who you are. And being Scottish, I'm sure you know this of the Scots, every New Year and every function, it's a sing-song night. Exactly. Forget karaoke, we do it live, and we're doing it in, you know, sometimes with unaccompanied and whatever. And I'm used to that, especially having a, my father was Irish, so we've got an Irish background as well. So that, that was always the way our lives were. So I'm used to singing in public. I'm used to singing, you know, what's your party piece and here we go, you know. And I'd always done that. So there was no real um, surprise about me going back to it. But the way I ended up back in it was quite strange. The, um, I, you're right, I, didn't, I don't think I performed live for t nearly 20 years, actually. And then because I got involved with Mike and the Mechanics, I started off just working for them as their vocal arranger, doing the stuff for a new album of theirs. And then Mike Rutherford said, we're going on a tour with Phil Collins around Europe and it's football stadiums and that. Would you, would you mind coming and singing? I'm like, who wouldn't, right? And these guys are not trying to hey, sell it flag into some of the biggest stadiums this in is true. Europe. Yeah. This is true, I sneaked it in there, especially at the Barcelona one, when we did the Bernabeu. Yeah. It's true, we played there and I snooked it in. But the, um, Mike Rutherford as well, and those guys have had so much success that, believe me, they ain't travelling about in a transit van. No. So I thought, I'm at a certain age, I think I might go for that. Before I knew it, I was in front of 95,000 people, even though Paul Carrick's fronting it, but I'm still doing it and I'm back there working it. And then off the back of that, my brother, uh, who's an original Simple Minds oh, member, yeah. drummer, and the bass player Derek Forbes, 
who wrote loads of the hits, one of the main writers in the band, asked me then to join them and become the front man for their project. So I kind of gently ended up back in the front line. And then with the, with the Simple Minds project, we ended up touring Germany, where they were very big there. And especially doing the earlier material, because like the Jim and Charlie still do all the hits to a point. But the, the thing that was successful in Europe and Germany and Belgium and Holland and was all the sort of really hardcore indie thing they did, which is what we do with the XSM project. And that meant that we ended up doing like three week tour in Germany, six shows in Holland. Before you know it, I'm now getting fully oiled back into being the guy, you know, yeah, and yeah. then, do you know what I mean? And I'm like feeling like I'm king of the castle and I can boss it, because for me, if you're not bossing it, don't do it, you know? And then off the back of that, as you know, I did some weird stuff from being the Ozzy Osbourne next door neighbor and that all got out of hand. And, uh, but last year, uh, I did a cameo appearance on Watchdog that's right. I've, yeah, I couldn't something like that. Yeah. And it's this that, in a way, that kind of re. I mean, that show is really massive, and it was it was part of the rogue traders rogue yeah. traders thing, and uh, did a thing where you know, as you would expect, they were busting some um, or exposing some security firm yeah, that were right, yeah. um, bullying pensioners into paying them Detectives, extortionate yeah. money. Da, da, da. Anyway, I got used in the piece and. Uh, burst in, sang the song, it was all very funny, but the interesting part about that is it seemed to remind bookers for festivals and organisers for tours like, you know, Rewind and those kind of things. Think, hang on a minute, he's back on the scene because they knew I'd been turning it down for 20 right, years because yeah. I didn't want to do it at all. I mean, I'm, I met you this year, I, mean, I, met, I was lucky enough to do one of these 80s gigs this year and mm. I, I felt it was like, to see you guys on stage, I was thinking, wow, you know, these people brought back so many memories. But... You know, you've, you've got all your own new material and it's like, that's what I want people to be hearing when all someone's right. coming back. You know, when, I, I can understand why people love the 80s and they want to see these guys perform, but you guys have got talent and some of you are brilliant songwriters and like, you know, tonight you're here for an acoustic set and it, people should be hearing that more, in my eyes. Like maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, yeah, I don't know. No, I, th I think you're right to a point, but I, I think if you're going to go to an 80s festival, say, yeah, I, I, I discussed this with Majeure, right? Yeah. Majeure was asked backstage in the dressing room or something, are you playing such and such a song from your new album? He said, well, that wouldn't be right on a night like this. Where if you go and buy a ticket to go and see Majeure, that's what you're going to get. So, yeah, I mean, I understand that. So you get your balance that you're going to be playing. If you're playing doing Rewind or Let's yeah. Rock Bristol, like the ones we did, or yeah. Let's Rock the Moor and Cook them, where that is booked as a specific 80s thing, they're going to get the 80s sets and really shouldn't get anything else, because that's what it's all about. Maybe you can just do an 80s version of your one now and just throw it in a, in a mix, I reckon. Well, that happens too. Ethiopian dance mix, I well, reckon. <laughs> <laughs> but that happens. Well, so, yeah. so you end up, you know, you, you will get your own material out some way or, you know, and off the back of doing those kind of shows, people, people come to events like, like tonight this. and that's how it works. So you're back out on the road doing an acoustic set and I've, I've been lucky enough to hear you warming up. Some of the noise. Yeah, and it's, you know what, your, your, your tone of voice is just amazing. How does it feel f for you to be doing this in, in, in front of people that want to hear you, not the long-haired pop star. I mean, you know, they want to hear you now. Because back then, you know, back in the 80s, they would just come out because it's... Well, they're just going to come and scream yeah. and wet their knickers or whatever. So do you think some of your you fans now do you wear tenor ladies just in case? <laughs> <laughs> I've brought some. <laughs> Is that for you? <laughs> but no, yeah, probably, yeah. I'm at that age where that's bound to happen sooner or later. But no, I mean, right now, you're right. I mean, it's, it's weird because although you know, you're saying people come to hear you sing, they still want to hear the hits and they want to hear that stuff. But most people are shocked that actually I can sing properly. And believe me, this guy can sing. I mean, look, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. I could chat for hours and we well, know that. We've done that. Well, we have and another done. night. And we'll another talk night. We'll talk about that. We'll be talking about that. Mr. Owen Paul McGee, pleasure. thank you for joining the ME1 TV. My pleasure, mate. Cheers, thank pal. You. Surely I